So Anthony leads the building simulation assessment and communications uh, in the energy systems program at CSIRO. Uh, this includes the development of Australia's benchmark tool, Accurate. Anthony also chairs the Australian Sustainable Built Environment Council uh, and the Sustainable Housing Task Group. Uh, and today will speak to us today about energy rating tool development in Australia. Anthony, the stage is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can. Excellent. I'm just going to have a go at sharing my screen. Okay, is that presentation showing up? Yes, we've got it. Excellent, thanks. Um, so yes, jumping from um, industrial energy down to the residential scale um, from one presentation to the next, I'll be talking about um, this, the work CSIRO does on residential energy rating tools in Australia because there's a lot of change going on at the moment and I think it has um, some pretty big implications, particularly for rooftop PV. Uh, how do I change slides? Oops, sorry, hi folks. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people as the traditional owners of the land that I'm speaking from today and pay my respect to their elders past and present. Um, now, we, where CSIRO operates, it's important to understand kind of the, the policy context and the implementation context for the talk I'm about to give. So I'll just give a little bit of background. At a national level, the COAG Energy Council has released a document called the Trajectory for Low Energy Buildings. That trajectory sets out a pathway um, for the increase in stringency for the minimum standards for residential buildings over the next few years. Um, it doesn't come out and say zero carbon, but it's not far off that sort of target. Under the Trajectory for Low Energy Buildings policy instrument sits the National Construction Code, which is a code that's taken up by the State Building Act and determines the minimum standards for new house development in Australia. So that's the six star energy rating standard that you've probably heard of. Um, what constitutes six stars is determined by the Nationwide House Energy Rating Scheme, um, more commonly known by its acronym NATHERS. Um, and that's all governed by the domestic buildings um, the, the Building Act and the Domestic Building Contracts Act. CSIRO sits below NATHERS essentially. We develop the benchmark software calculation engine that um, is used to determine what constitutes six stars. So we work very closely with the Commonwealth Government to set the parameters around um, what a six star house looks like. And we develop the modeling software that sits behind all of the modeling software used out in industry to determine um, the six star standard. So everything is changing at the moment. Policy and regulatory settings are in the process of changing. The trajectory is only a year or two old now, and it sets out a whole lot of um, different changes, both to the National Construction Code um, and to voluntary measures. And the National Construction Code is in the process, it's just closed, in fact, a public consultation period looking at the new standards to be implemented in 2022. In parallel to that, there are a whole lot of new tools being developed. Um, until now, the tools that we've used to do energy rating have been reasonably sophisticated in the way they do their calculations, but not very sophisticated or contemporary in the way they're deployed and um, put out to users. They've been um, fairly technical desktop application software. So some new tools are coming along developed by CSIRO. We're looking at Accurate Whole of House to start off with. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But in the past, we've only looked at the thermal shell. That's the um, heating and cooling energy and the, the impact of the building shell and insulation and so on on the heating and cooling demand of the house. That's going to move to whole of house, um, which essentially includes a whole range of additional modules around different appliance energy use. We're also developing Accurate Enterprise. So Accurate is our benchmark software. We're moving that to the cloud and the new name is Accurate Enterprise. That will allow a whole range of different services to be offered, including batch mode processing and stock modeling and um, so on. We're also working on a 
a version of Accurate that's got the working title of Watson at the moment that will be used for the rating of existing houses. This is important because until now, only new houses have been required to go through the regulatory system. The trajectory for low energy buildings contemplates the Commonwealth developing a framework for the disclosure of energy performance at sale or lease. Um, and so there is a need for tools and approaches to generating energy ratings for existing houses as well. So Watson is our um, uh, one of our products aimed at that. We're also working to integrate a third party app called Magic Plan, which I'll show you a little demonstration of a bit later, um, that allows the collection of data from existing houses into the Watson tool much easier. And we're also working with neural networks to see if we can speed up the way we do energy ratings and reduce the number of inputs that we need to make those to get a, a general sense of the energy rating of a building. Okay, so National Construction Code. Um, for residential buildings, so that's houses and apartments or class one and two buildings, the Australian Building Codes Board has developed two sets of draft provisions, um, which it's testing through public consultation. That public consultation period has just closed. The two options are, number one, um, a set of provisions which, which results in residential buildings having a level of thermal cover co comfort equivalent to seven stars. So that's one star higher than the current minimum standard and net zero annual energy use for the regulated building services. That's the whole of house approach I spoke about. The regulated services under the code are space conditioning, heated water systems, lighting and pool and spa pumps. Option two involves a set of provisions that would result in residential buildings having a level of thermal comfort equivalent to seven stars again, but a moderate amount of annual energy use for the regulated services. So that's sort of a, a, um, an energy budget versus a, a net zero kind of approach. Both of the options would allow the use of PV to offset those regulated services energy consumption to achieve the required societal cost of energy performance metric. So that's a really big change from where we've been. We've been only modeling the thermal shell, so just heating and cooling energy demand. Um, we are now going to whole of house and allowing the offsetting of um, major appliances against PV generation. So what do the whole of house tools look like? Um, thermal shell, seven stars, as I said. The thermal shell calculation will, for the first time, also include thermal bridging calculations, new updated climate files and revised occupancy profiles. The regulated services I've already talked about, heating and cooling appliances, hot water systems, lighting, pool pumps, and PVs. So I have included in this presentation a little bit of information about the PV module. Um, I have to say at the outset though, I am not a scientist and I'm not going to be able to answer highly technical questions about how we do this. But if someone would be so good as to drop my email address into the chat, I would be happy to send you some papers on how we're doing this and put you in touch with the scientists who will give you the right answer as opposed to my answer. Um, so the PV module that we are developing, and as I said, this is out for public consultation at the moment. There's some people playing with our draft software to see if it generates um, believable results. Um, so the power output of the PV array is calculated as per Lambert, Gilman and Lilienthal. Um, and you can read a bit about that information there, what we include in, in terms of data inputs and how we do that calculation. The software looks a little bit like this screen share on the right. So the data user input, the imp, sorry, the user input data fields are the latitude and longitude of the location obtained from the climate zone user input, PV size, PV collector slope, PV collector surface azimuth angle, PV derating factor, and ground diffuse reflectance. And from that, we do an hour by hour annual uh, generation calculation. And you can see down the bottom here, the um, PV power output per year. So that's the new PV module. All of the other modules that we are developing, you can see up the top, pool pumps, space heating, um, space cooling, and so on, have similar um, kinds of approaches behind them. Now, the new products that we're developing. Um, so I've arranged this slide to try and explain how all of this fits together, all these new products. Um, the vertical columns describe the, um, the kind of software architecture um, and the horizontal flow is the various products. So in the user interface, we have Accurate Enterprise, which is our cloud tool. 
um, which goes to our Chenith engine and API and batch processing um, system. Third party front ends can also access that. So Accurate won't be the only front end for that calculation process. Watson, as I said, a, a different version of Accurate for existing houses also uses the same engine and calculation process. So a user uses one of those software packages or magic plan that feeds into Watson um, to input the geometry and the materials and so on for those uh, for the house. That goes in and is cal the, the energy um, consumption and PV output is calculated in the engine there and the results are returned to the user and sent to what we call the H star portal house energy rating um, portal for generating a compliance certificate. The information that's generated um, in creating that compliance certificate is stored in a CSIRO database and we do public visualizations at the Australian Housing Data Portal which is ahd.csiro.au and you can see um, the information we collect from all of those ratings there. Um, third parties can also access that data via API and we're working with a number of people at the moment on data uses. And we also use that data to feed a neural network that we called fast rate down the bottom. I'm going to, I'm just gonna show you a screenshot of the new Accurate enterprise. Um, I don't anticipate there'll be a lot of Accurate users in the audience, um, but if there were, you would see that there's a pretty big change in the way we're doing things. Moving to the cloud allows us to use third party tools like Google Maps and so on to get much better location of blocks, even when they're not subdivided yet, um, and to provide a whole lot better feedback to our users. Ultimately though, the interface is still a data entry interface. Um, as the benchmark tool, we have to be capable of modeling any house at all and three-dimensional representations of um, buildings and so on are, are often um, constrained in one way or another and we can't have that constraint as the benchmark engine. Our front-end developers often choose to have um, 3D um, interfaces and, and drawing style interfaces um, and to be applicable to the vast majority of housing and leave the more complex houses to accurate but we have kept our interface more or less the same only using these new um, cloud tools. The Magic Plan app, I do have a little video embedded in here, which I will try to play now. I hope it comes through to your screen. So in Magic Plan, um, we can scan a room using a, a mobile device, so a mobile phone or a, um, a, 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 an iPad. So you'll see my colleague Michael here scanning a room in his house. You can see it's a room like any one of us would have with stuff on the floor and furniture and so on. The app uses a LiDAR edge detection process to pick up the edges of the room. It will complete the room. You can set the ceiling height. And then it automatically detects windows and doors. It allows you to select the opening types. It works just as well on internal openings when they don't have doors and you can select opening and the software will calculate the airflow through those openings. It also works even when there's complex screens and so on obscuring those openings. So once the room is scanned, the app will provide it to you in plan and the user can then um, modify that plan as they need to. We attach forms to it that allow you, the user to decide which kind of zone it is for the purposes of calculating occupancy for the energy rating. I'll just follow on with that video with a second video. Those forms also allow specific details related to the energy efficiency simulation to be added. So materials, insulation, roof pitches, and so on. So 
So here, Michael's adding a new room, resizing it in the magic plan interface, setting up the zone parameters. Adding windows and doors. The room can then be added to the plan. So you can build up the floor plan in two dimensions as if you were drawing the plan, or you can do it by scanning the, um, each room and uh, as you go through the house. Orientation can be adjusted after the fact. Once complete, you then export the design, <coughs> excuse me, to Watson for simulation. Completed design can then have the energy efficiency elements change to explore the impact on the energy rating. So you're adding and subtracting <coughs> insulation and changing other elements of the building design. Ultimately, we hope to be able to do this through a batch mode processing approach so that the user could specify um, that the house be calculated with a variety of different inputs and the, um, the most cost-effective um, approach to a certain star rating could be generated. Rooms can have changes made at any time, um, like changes in floor covering or whatever else is necessary. Once the user's happy, export again and get your new results back to compare and pass on to the client. Okay, so that software is intended to be used in existing houses to start generating quite complex um, energy consumption and generation models for those houses. The data that we've collected from the certificates that have already been generated over the last five years, and I say 850,000 in this, it's just over a million now as of the last couple of weeks. Um, so we've collected the, those million certificates. They've got a whole lot of information about those houses. So we've built a proof of concept neural network to see how few inputs we need to generate a reasonably accurate star rating output. So the team has gone through the process of condensing the NATO certificate information to the 12 variables that you can see in the large text box in the middle. We have then trained um, machine learning algorithms and tested a whole variety and evaluated the best model, uh, which we're calling fast rate. This is all thermal shell only at the moment. Um, PVs and other whole of house modules will be added to this neural network when sufficient data is available to train the model. So far from those 12 inputs, we can generate three outputs, star rating, heating load, and cooling load. The mean difference is 0.3 of a star. The median difference is 0.2 of a star between full model and neural network output. And 90% of results have a difference of less than 0.7 stars. You can see from the scatter plot that I have at the bottom of the screen that some of them have significantly higher. And we're working at the moment to try and isolate which set of parameters generates um, the, those greatest divergences so that we can exclude them from the model in future. So we think this fast rate neural network approach might be a really good approach to getting very quick ratings of existing buildings where there is no um, intention to pay or to have someone come out to the house to do the rating. We might be able to use pretty simple building information to generate um, near enough star ratings. So I am running out of time. So 2022, there's a whole lot of change coming. Um, whole of house tools, including PV modeling and hopefully an increase in regulatory stringency coming from the Australian Building Codes Board. We're delivering accurate enterprise software as a service, including improved user experience, batch mode processing, stock modeling, and potentially new front ends. 
We've developed Watson for existing homes and the Magic Plan integration should have all the benefits of Accurate Enterprise and our cloud implementation, but for existing houses. And the fast rate neural network is aimed at getting quick NATHERS rating estimates, um, targeting very few inputs out there into the community. Beyond 2022, we're also hoping to deliver a consumer lookup website for NATHERS ratings to allow um, a homeowner to find out what their NATHERS rating is if it's in our system. Um, we're looking at data integrations with industry and with universities, and we're developing a security app for multi-factor authentication of NATHERS ratings and on-site compliance checking. So the take home messages, I suppose, for a solar crowd, um, New housing standards may change in 2022. One likely outcome of the change is, an increase, is the increased use of rooftop PV in new houses because it will be more difficult to get regulatory compliance with minimum standards without installing PV um, and designing PV into um, the building before it's built. In 2021, we built 140,000 houses in Australia and 60,000 apartments. So assuming a majority of those houses at least need PV arrays um, the day they're built or the day they get their certificate of occupancy, there could be a significant bump in the number of um, photovoltaic systems going in in new houses. Consumer awareness of housing energy efficiency is also growing and new tools and programs targeting existing houses are expected to accelerate this. One of the things that's likely to come with um, energy ratings being more publicly available and of more interest to homeowners is the expectation that industry will provide advice on how to improve the energy performance of homes. And I expect this to be a further driver of um, PV uptake and also more efficient appliances, as well as building shell upgrades. The trajectory for low energy buildings will increase the focus on the existing 8 million dwellings energy performance in coming years to support all of this. And that will be a big focus of government over the next couple of years. So hopefully we're in a good position to not only improve thermal performance, but also add even more rooftop PV than we have been to date. Thank you. That's the end of my talk and I will try and unshare the screen. Thank you, Anthony. Um, that was terrific. We do have a, a couple of minutes for questions. Um, and I have one in the room from, is that Anna? <laughs> it doesn't. Um, and oh, one from Trevor. So I don't, I was my question, which we'll get to later, but I, it re perhaps reflects on Trevor's. Um, or I was just going to make a statement actually that uh, yesterday Trevor um, presented on the um, energy efficiency ratings and the correlation with house pricing and it'd be I'd be interested but let's get to the others first just I talked while I was getting to Anna um, on how Nathas and ratings and house prices are correlated but here's Anna. Thanks Renata and thanks Anthony for that excellent talk. Um, I was just wondering if I know that there's a lot of uncertainty with um, modelling um, building uh, thermal performance and particularly around air change rates and things like that. I was wondering, um, you know, in in terms of the validation that you've already done, what kind of uncertainty is there and are you planning to do any further validation and um, yeah, just your general view on those issues? Yeah, great question um, and hugely important. So we, the biggest validation study that was done was called the ex post evaluation of the five star standard. Um, the report from that unfortunately probably doesn't have the best data we had because um, of timeline. So we only got nine months worth of monitoring before the final report needed to be done. That study looked at um, 324 houses in Melbourne, Adelaide and Brisbane um, and monitored them in the end for six years. So. As I said, the report was written at the end of the first nine months of modeling, uh, monitoring, so um, probably not the best. What, what we did is we went back at the end of the six years and did a validation study looking at um, those houses for which we'd collected a full six years worth of data. And that varied on different um, elements between kind of 120 and 160 houses, I think, in total. So that's the biggest study that's been done. What we found is that when we correct for the occupancy assumptions, so you're probably aware that Nathurs has a whole range of occupancy assumptions, which are the, the primary cause of divergence between um, 
the, the predicted result and the actual result. So if we corrected for those occupancy assumptions, we get an R squared of about 0.82 between modeled and actual energy consumption at a whole of house annual level. Um, where the greatest divergences exist, the first place is plug load appliances, as you might imagine. Um, there's a huge diversity in what people do with plug load appliances, and we didn't monitor down to the individual um, general power outlet level. So we didn't know exactly what you know computer equipment and so on people were running in their houses. Um, the other area of major divergence is in air conditioning um, use. So we tend to find that the NATO software on the whole underestimates air conditioning use. But when we do that, um, predicted versus actual energy consumption graph, you, you know, you'd expect to see a nice diagonal line from the bottom left of that graph to the top right with, um, you know, actual and predicted being identical if things were all good. What we see is two clusters of results, one above and one below that line. And one of our kind of hypotheses is that there are two groups of people using their houses in different ways. Some people operate their houses more as um, passive solar style houses where they open and close windows and doors to catch cooling breezes and, and actively use their house to maintain stable temperatures. Other people take a more office building approach and run their air conditioner day and night and don't open and close their windows and doors. And there's an active debate in the kind of energy rating space around what sort of behaviors we are encouraging what sort of behaviors we're allowing and enabling through the regulatory system and what's the balance between um, building fabric and kind of consumer behavior that or occupant behavior that we need to meet in order to get the lowest possible energy consumption so it's a really live issue at the moment um, so to get back to your general question i think that you know a correlation of R squared of 0.82 is pretty good, really, given the um, the range of kind of climatic and other parameters that are involved in modeling a whole house. Um, but there is room for improvement, particularly in air conditioning use. Jennifer says thanks. <laughs> and uh, we have Trevor Lee here as well with a question. Yeah, first, I'd like to congratulate CSIRO through you for the fabulous lineup of work that. Uh, you're about to do and uh, have done. Um, uh, my first question is purely bureaucratic. Uh, are you able to disclose whether or not all of the states and territories are on board with these intended changes? Um, well, I can't disclose anything like that because I don't work for any of the states and territories and presumably they have their own process to go through, but I won't give you a totally um, weasel words answer. Um, at the moment, there is a lot of doubt. The regulatory impact um, assessment um, came back saying there was a negative cost benefit to the changes that are before the ABCB at the moment. Um, there is uh, on the so so the, basically there's there's a big push there saying these these regulatory um, stringency increases won't have a good cost benefit, so we shouldn't do them. On the other side of the ledger, we have a direction from the building ministers to the Australian Codes Board to to look at astringency increase. And we have New South Wales and Victoria that have both made statements um, to the effect that they're gonna go ahead with some form of stringency increase in their states, regardless of what happens at the ABCB level. So I would guess that there is support for the stringency increase from Victoria and New South Wales. Um, there is some doubt from industry about the costs. And then we have a number of states who are already varying out of the um, the, the national provision. So the Northern Territory and Queensland both vary um, away from the code to greater or lesser degrees. Um, and we have other states like Western Australia where um, it, it's taken them a bit longer to catch up with NCC 2019 and the leap to 2022 may be great for them. So I'm not sure how it will all play out in the end. Um, uh, if I had to guess, I would hope that we get the stringency increase, but that we might see a variety of transition times across the country, some states jumping on board quicker than others would be my best guess. But it is just a guess. I don't have any special information from the Building Codes Board or from the Commonwealth Department handling all of this. And my second and final question was, uh, you referred to updating the uh, climate data in Accurate. Can I get you to disclose the end year of that climate data, given we've had warmer yep. year after warmer year in the last That's decade. the 2016 climate data. 
Um, so it, it's oh, you're testing me if you ask me how many years prior to 2016 it includes, but it's something like 25. Um, it's I don't think our users are going to see a major difference in um, climate information from those files compared to the earlier files. I think a lot of what the change has done is clean up the data that went into those files um, and that the, the, the overall change has not been that great given all of the, the various statistical tweakings that have that go on to create those files. Um, Trevor, you're, a, you're, you're much better versed in this stuff than I am. And I, you know, I, you've provided comment on our future climate files, which is another thing we're developing. So um, we do have climate change scenario files that we have released um, for free to the public and to energy raters to use in a couple of formats. We've had some feedback both from Trevor and from other people on various aspects of those and we're looking to do another iteration of them next year to improve upon them and probably to offer um, a range of climate models as well as RCP scenarios and um, and time periods. So there'll be a bit more detail in those files and that should allow energy raters to look at future climate change um, scenarios when they're doing their energy ratings. I know the Commonwealth Department is interested in the use of um, climate change projection climate files for commercial buildings to begin with and I suspect that as time goes on there'll be interest in the residential sector as well around that sort of thing. But uh, again, that's a policy decision and, and not something I control where we're data providers to that policy process rather than leading it. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Uh, thank you, Trevor, for the, for the question. Um, so this, I think, concludes our plenary session for the morning. Um, so I would like to thank again, our, all of our plenary speakers. So Anthony, Susan, Mark, and Ian. Uh, we have around 30 people online and or 20 people in the room here, so a, a decent audience under the circumstances. Uh, we now go from here to um, a poster session, uh, and there's, I think that there's a, a session in a, one session in parallel in, in CST, I think. Uh, so thank you, join me in thanking our plenary speakers, and we'll close the session. Thank you, everybody.